Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 14th and final webinar in the Cardiovascular Connections 2022 series. Today's webinar is titled Experimental Design Considerations to Optimize Chronic Cardiovascular Telemetry Studies, featuring Dr. Phil Griffiths, Research Sales Manager, Europe at AD Instruments. Today, he will draw from his experience as a telemetry user to discuss some important considerations for designing telemetry studies. Before we get started, we'd just like to acknowledge our partners at the American Physiological Society and the European Council for Cardi Cardiovascular Research. And in particular, I'd like to thank this session's sponsor, AD Instruments, for helping to make this event possible. AD Instruments creates simple, flexible tools to help scientists record and analyze data quickly and efficiently. Powerful, flexible, and accurate, their products are cited in more than 30,000 peer-reviewed journal articles, and the equipment is the preferred choice for thousands of scientists and educators around the world. I'm excited to have Phil Griffiths join me on the floor. Phil, you can take it away. Thank you very much, Sydney. Um... Hi everybody, uh, thanks for joining us today for this webinar. Um, so I'm going to, as Sydney's already said, uh, talk about some experimental design considerations for, for chronic telemetry studies. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I've got a bachelor's and PhD in neuroscience from the University of Bristol in the UK. Um, where I also uh, got four and a half years postdoc experience using the car sciences pressure telemeters, uh, which when I'm talking specifically about a telemetry system today, I'm going to talk, talk about that one because it's the one I know most about. Um, in 2019, I left academia and moved to work for car sciences as the telemetry application specialist for Europe. Um, uh, and then Car Sciences was bought by AD Instruments in um, 2021, uh, at which point I moved over to work as a training and technical support specialist in the European team. Uh, from July of this year, I'm now a research sales manager in Europe, so managing uh, the research sales team across Europe. Just to give a quick outline of, of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, firstly, we'll look at uh, what the benefits of chronic uh, uh, studies for in vivo experiments are over acute studies. I'll do a little bit of an explanation about what the different study types are, acute uh, and chronic studies, uh, and then how telemetry fits into this and the benefits that you get with telemetry. Uh, then we'll move on to the experimental design side of things to, to look a little bit about how to decide the best sample sizes, um, the importance of the technology that you're using in, in, in uh, getting that sample size right as well, uh, and the length of experiments, um, how long do your experiments need to be for the experimental questions that you're, you're asking. Um, then we'll move on to some really uh, the basic tips for data acquisition and data handling, uh, looking at some of the AD Instruments uh, software you know, uh, briefly to, to explain uh, how best to use um, software for to handle the large amount of data that you can collect. And then lastly, we'll talk about maintaining high animal welfare standards, which is really important for collecting the best and most physiologically relevant data from your, from your studies. So first of all, I just wanted to give a bit of background on to, to what I mean when I'm talking about uh, acute studies and chronic studies and the differences between them. So first of all, uh, acute studies um, can be categorized in, as invasive recordings in anesthetized animals. Now these are one-off measurements. Most of the time you take your animal for that particular day, you make the recordings that you want to make, uh, and then you cull the animal at the end of the experiment. Um, you're able to make high fidelity, um, high sampling frequency recordings and record a number of parameters. So for instance, you might be familiar with using Miller catheters uh, or Miller PV catheters from AD instruments for uh, recording cardiovascular parameters alongside uh, biopotential like ECG as well. So you can combine a number of parameters. Um, 
which make these experiments quite powerful and quite invasive in, in what you can record. But the, the time that you're able to record is, is limited often um, to minutes, uh, from minutes to hours. And during that time, the experimenter needs to be there, present with the animal, um, and making sure that the data collected is, is the correct data. Um, some other things to consider with these experiments is that it's very difficult to account for anesthesia and the impact of anesthesia on the, the physiology that you're observing. Um, and also you have to bear in mind uh, the physiological state of the animal when you take it. So the particular time of day and the, the, the circadian rhythm that uh, or the, the period of the circadian rhythm that the animal will be in at that time of day needs to be considered. Um, and the, if you're using female animals, then the oestrus state should be considered as well. Um, moving on, we can have a, a kind of similar to acute studies, but, but these are non-invasive measurements. So these are either one-off uh, measurements with, with animals or periodically repeated. And this is something like uh, non-invasive blood pressure with uh, the CODA monitor. Um, uh, and tail cuff uh, blood pressure recordings. Um, while these can be really powerful experiments, particularly if you've got a large number of animals that you need to phenotype or screen uh, for, for in a relatively short period of time. But each of the animals needs an element of training on the restraint and, and uh, that is required for this uh, to get good data from this. Um, so quite a lot of technical expertise is required from the, whoever's handling the animals and there is time that needs to be invested as well. Um, what you get from these uh, experiments is a snapshot. It's the same as, as using a sphygma, a sphygma manometer on a human and um, getting a, a systolic uh, mean and diastolic blood pressure. Um, it's a snapshot at that one point in time. You don't get your continuous waveform data. Um, so like I say, for phenotyping, you know, a large colony of animals, it can be quite useful, but, but yeah, this technique certainly has its limitations. Um, the last thing that I'm going to talk about here is, is a chronic experiment um, not using telemetry, and that's using tethering. So this is implanting your cannula or your electrodes in your animal, uh, externalizing that at the usually at the shoulder blades or on the head, and then connecting to an external amplifier via a tether. Um, now, these can be repeated over days. Uh, with good surgery, you can get um, pretty good recording from these um, over a number of days and perhaps a number of weeks. And this is quite common still in, in neuroscience studies. Um, but your recording time per day is usually limited to a maximum of a number of hours. And again, you're usually just recording from one animal at a time. Some things to consider is the risk of infection at the point where the, the leads are externalized or the cannula, cannula is externalized from the animal. Um, that's kind of effectively always open um, and uh, difficult to, to maintain the cleanliness there sometimes. Um, you can get movement artifacts as the animal's moving around and the tether is moving. The tether itself can be quite a large antenna for picking up environmental electrical noise. Um, so you can get noise in your recordings. Um, and then lastly, there is the restriction of behavior. Um, you know, the animals are restrained to a degree with the tether, so that might affect the behavior and it may well affect the physiology that you're recording as well. Where telemetry comes in and the advantages of telemetry is that you're recording conscious, unrestrained data um, and physiological parameters from your animals. Telemeters are fully implantable, so once animals have, have um, uh, once telemeters have uh, been implanted and the animals have recovered from surgery, um, the, the signal that you record is, is really high quality and there's minimal day-to-day -day maintenance of those animals as well. Um, on top of that, you can have multiple animals running simultaneously. Uh, 
with that and because of the the recovery once the animal's recovered uh, and the rec recording is and the parameters are fairly uh, stable uh, you can record for for long term uh, over weeks or months uh, which allows you to capture long term vari variation in physiological parameters um, although telemetry equipment is often quite a large investment to to get it into the uh, your facility to begin with once it's there um, the the improvement in data that you get from telemetered animals um, and the, the the better quality of signals that you get might mean that you need fewer animals per group to show statistical significance um, and reduce the general staff maintenance that's required for, for running telemetry studies as well so now i've kind of introduced uh, and hopefully explained a little bit about the benefits of telemetry, we'll think about planning our chronic experiments, our telemetry experiments. So the benefits of chronic experiments over acute experiments. Um, acute experiments, as we've discussed, can be invasive or periodic, but each time you're taking a different animal um, and you're looking at physiological variables in different animals, um, with telemetry, you can take the same animal and repeat your measurements over a number of days and a number of weeks. Um, other telemetry systems compared to the car sciences system uh, are battery reliant. So the, the duration of um, recording that you can make with a telemetry system is, is limited by the battery. Kaha Sciences uses wireless power, and I'll explain a bit more about that in, in a couple of slides time. Um, and that really increases the flexibility with your, your telemetry study. Um, but essentially with chronic telemetry studies, you can perform experiments over a long period of time. Um, you can observe experimental variables under a conscious physiological state. Um, you can account for natural uh, physiological variation like Easter state, or circadian rhythm. Uh, and as I say, the, the, with the car sciences system and the wireless power technology, you can potentially collect continuous data uh, for the duration of your experiment as well. Something to consider though, is how long your experiment should actually be. Um, now, long experiments uh, might seem like the best thing to do, you know, maximizing the data that you're collecting from each animal. Um, but these can be more expensive because either you need more equipment uh, in order to, to run a larger group um, or you have to have your study uh, running over a longer period of time in order to maximise your sample size. Um, or you might need to compromise and just end up with a smaller sample size in the long run. You need to balance the length of the experiment then with the experimental question that you're asking. You know, if you're looking at an aging study or you're looking at progression of a disease, then you may want to record data, uh, physiological parameters over a really long period of time. If you're looking at a pharmacology study where you're just repeatedly dosing for a couple of weeks um, and then the, the kind of useful uh, um, you know, you need maybe a large sample size, you might just say that two weeks or three weeks is long enough to collect data from the animal with a number of doses. Um, and while I've said that with the Kaha telemetry system, and I'll explain a bit more why this is possible, you can record continuously. That's not necessarily saying that you should, and that's the most appropriate thing to do with you for your experiments. Um, so longer experiments might lead you to a smaller sample size. With all telemetry, there's going to be a lot of data to analyze. Um, but with a long experiment, you're looking at um, a lot of data from each animal individually. You also have to consider the lifespan of your animal. You know, if you're implanting um, in a six month old rat and then the lifespan of the rat is, is two years, then um, you're limited in that amount of time that you can record or at 12 months and then you've got a, a year to play with. Uh, shorter experiments would give you a larger sample, um, less data to analyse from each animal, but probably still the same similar amount of data to analyse in total. But does this really reflect the, the value of the experiment and answer the questions that you're, you're asking? 
So Carhartt Science's telemetry, as I've said, benefits from wireless power. What this means is that the, um, the uh, data receiver, the TR181 smart pad or the MT110 um, T-Base for the mouse system, um, produce a wireless power field. So while the telemeter uh, implanted in the rat uh, is, is over the top of this, uh, the data receiver or in uh, the mouse for the, for the T-Base, um, the telemeter is receiving wireless power continuously, uh, which means that it removes the, the reliance and the restriction of batteries to allow you to record for a much longer period of time. Um, it also opens up the possibility of continuous experiments and continuous recording where wireless power supports this continuous recording and allows you to collect more data from each animal. Now that might not be appropriate for your study, but if you're looking for any kind of spontaneous activity like uh, an arrhythmia in an ECG, or you're looking at uh, seizure activity in an epilepsy model, for instance, then being able to capture more data means that you're more likely to see those, those spontaneous events occurring and you'll capture more of those spontaneous events. Um, there's also a quick turnaround with these telemeters. So without the, the restriction of battery life, um, the rat telemeters are reusable. Uh, the mouse telemeters are designed to be disposed of after one use. So there's no costly time consuming uh, refurbishment. You, know, you can reuse the rat telemeters uh, a few times um, and uh, uh, yeah, so kind of removes that need for the refurbishment process. Um, when thinking about designing your experiment and the um, statistical, uh, uh, well, you have to think about the statistical power of your study uh, and the effect that that's gonna have on the sample size that you need. So how likely are differences between experimental groups going to be statistically significant for a particular statistical test? Um, and as I say, this depends on sample size, uh, the variability of the observations that you're looking to see, uh, the size of the effect, and the significance level that you're looking for. Now, most of the time uh, in physiology, we're looking for, for your significance level at less than 0 0.05. Um, so if you have a large effect um, with a, a fairly consistent large effect, it may be that in order to achieve your significant level, you need a smaller sample size. Now, if you have a smaller, smaller but consistent effect, then it might be that you need uh, to have a larger sample size, but you'll still reach your statistical significance. But as we know, I mean, we're physiologists, we understand that, that data is going to vary slightly from um, uh, different animals uh, within your population of animals, that you're going to get a different response perhaps to, to your experiment. Um, so you may end up with a variable effect, which leads you to needing a larger sample size um, and, uh, and a bit of uh, unknown whether you'll reach your, uh, your statistical um, significance level. Um, what I'm going to say is that we can never remove that variation of physiology. That's just natural variation in the population. But what is very important is that we're using the technology that um, reduces that the variation that can be introduced uh, into your measurements by the technology. So things like the tethering, um, and perhaps the uh, you know the acute invasive experiments where you're using an anaesthetic or the tethering where there might be some influence of, of the, the restraint on the animals are going to introduce some variability. Whereas telemetry allows you to have much uh, more confidence in not introducing any extra variation into your data. With Kaha Sciences telemetry as well. Um, you can be more confident in reducing that variability thanks to the rat pressure telemeters incorporating the Miller microtip pressure sensor at the catheter tip. These are gold standard um, solid state pressure sensors that are located uh, at the catheter tip and allow you to measure pressure directly at the site of interest. So no need to, to transmit a pressure wave uh, along a fluid filled catheter to a transducer elsewhere. You're actually recording pressure where you want to be recording pressure. 
This means that there's no long-term sig uh, signal attenuation uh, and reduced variability between uh, uh, animals. Uh, they show an excellent frequency response because, again, you're not transmitting that pressure wave to a transducer elsewhere. So you'll see for something like a left ventricular pressure where you see that really fast pressure change on contraction of the left ventricle, you can really accurately capture that with a, um, a car sciences telemeter and a Miller uh, pressure catheter. Um, they're also incredibly accurate and even at low pressure. So that allows you to be confident in detecting small changes in pressure um, as well. Car sciences telemetry um, allows a higher sampling rate as well, up to two kilohertz. Um, so this really improves your signal fidelity. Um, and we'll explain a little bit more. I'll explain a little bit more about sampling rate in, in a couple of slides time. Um, and also the quick turnaround that you can do with these telemeters as well. Um, and while we can never remove that physiological variation completely from our population of animals that we might be looking at, we can be confident that we're not introducing extra variability from, from the study that we're carrying out with a telemetry study. So I'm going to move on now to think about what uh, the considerations for, for data acquisition, what to think about uh, when you're planning your study, before you start your study, um, uh, in how to collect and handle the data that you, you produce with a telemetry study. So first of all, um, I've already mentioned sampling rate. Uh, I mentioned sampling rate a couple of slides ago, uh, that the car sciences telemeters allow you to sample at two kilohertz. Now, sampling frequency, hopefully that didn't confuse anybody, so I'll explain it now. Sampling frequency, sampling rate, refers to the number of data points collected per second. So 2 kilohertz means that you're collecting 2,000 data points per second. Um, hopefully you can see this um, arterial pressure waveform plotted as individual data points without the line drawn through them. Uh, this is at 1 kilohertz, and you can see the change from uh, diastole to systole. You see quite a number of data points drawn on this uh, uh, on this rising phase of the pressure waveform. Um, at a lower sampling rate, you'll have fewer points plotted on that line, uh, on that rising phase. And so the accuracy of your waveform will be uh, slightly different and the shape of your waveform will be slightly different as well. So in simple terms, the more data points that you can plot per second, the more accurate your waveform. And this next slide, kind of hopefully emphasizes that um, a little bit more. So this is the same ECG signal recorded from a mouse using a Kaha um, uh, mouse pressure telemeter, the mouse biopotential telemeter, sorry. Um, and you can see that the data was actually recorded at two kilohertz, um, 2000 samples per second. And what you can see is a really nice consistent ECG waveform um, with a nice, uh, crisp R peak um, because you're plotting uh, a lot of data points per second. Now this uh, has been downsampled in lab chart. So this is what effectively what the same waveform would look like if sampled at 400 Hertz. And you see that by reducing the um, sampling rate by a factor of five, you see that you quite markedly change the shape and the dynamics of your waveform that you're collecting. It's um, the QRS complex has changed shape quite considerably. And you also see on this final R wave that you've got a kind of uh, missed peak where you don't have that crisp peak that you had before. Now, a really extreme example would be uh, it is shown here by downsampling by a factor of 10 to uh, 200 hertz. And you can see that that QRS complex has almost completely disappeared. You still see the R wave, but you've also got a kind of floating peak um, in time, so it's not consistent. So choosing the wrong sampling rate is going to affect the data that you can extract from this. So if you were looking at calculating RR interval for heart rate variability or something like that, then too low a sampling rate is going to affect that data that you see and impact your calculations and, and, and any um, inferences you make from that downstream.
Having said that, um, combining long-term studies with uh, lots of animals uh, and a high sampling rate is going to lead you to having very large data files. So, for instance, sampling at 2 kilohertz um, with uh, eight channels of data, so let's say that's blood pressure from eight animals, uh, eight rats, um, is going to give you a file size of about 2.8 gigabytes um, for a recording time of 24 hours. Now, while um, the AD Instruments data acquisition software, both LabChart 8 and LabChart Lightning, are perfectly capable of handling files of this size, um, the processing capacity of your computer might not be. So it's very important to think about how you're collecting this data. Um, and just some simple tips to, to making sure that your, your data collection is as uninterrupted as possible. Um, is to make sure you use a dedicated uh, acquisition computer. You know, don't try and use that computer for three other things at the same time. Just let it sit there and acquire the data into LabChart. You can also um, schedule your recording to manage your file size. Um, so by taking smaller chunks for each file will mean that you have, um, um, uh, you can manage your file size that way. And finally, please just consider your data storage carefully. Um, back up your data in the cloud, back it up in a couple of physical locations as well, just to make sure that you don't run the risk of, of ever losing the data that you collect. When you're thinking about beginning your study, um, it's also important to look into the future. So. Think about what data analysis you're going to do with your um, physiological parameters that you collect and think about how you might want to present that data in your publication, in your PhD thesis. Um, and a good question to ask for telemetry studies is, do you need 24 hours of waveform data? So I'm going to take a couple of examples, um, one way you might not and one way you might. Um, so if you're recording long-term blood pressure from a large sample size of animals, you're going to collect a lot of data. Um, periodic memes uh, and scheduling your recording to only take short snippets of waveform data, for instance, every 10 minutes of every hour, is going to help to reduce your file size for downstream analysis and management. And that's perfectly acceptable because uh, this paper that was published uh, some time ago now, but by my... Um, old colleague Sarah Jane Guild from, from Car Sciences um, shows that, that by taking a 10 minute um, snippet of, of uh, waveform data every hour, the mean blood pressure that you can, uh, that you can calculate from that is, is going to be as um, accurate as, as comparing to, to an hour um, or, or averaging over the entire hour period. And so this really helps you to just reduce that amount of data that you need and make the, the, the files far more easy to, to handle. On the flip side of this, if you're recording, um, so I've got the example of EEG activity to identify seizures, or you're interested in a sleep-wake cycle, or you're looking for some kind of a spontaneous event like an arrhythmia, you're going to want to acquire as much data as you possibly can and you're going to want the waveform data for all 24 hours of your recording. Um, this means that you might want to just think about breaking your files down um, with regular file saving to, to make them more easy to handle. So uh, every three hours in this example is maybe a bit extreme, but you could have two 12-hour files for, for a 24-hour period, for instance. Uh, and that's just going to mean that you can still capture that data, but it makes each individual file slightly easier to deal with. Uh, I'm just going to take this opportunity to highlight some uh, development that we're doing in LabChart Lightning at the moment. And LabChart Lightning is our new data acquisition software at AD Instruments. Um, and it's showing some really nice uh, development towards really benefiting uh, telemetry users uh, in telemetry studies. 
So what first thing what you can do is you can, this is simulated data for any eagle, eagle eyed amongst you. I've made it look as close to a, a blood pressure and an ECG as possible with some, some simple simulated data. Um, but you can um, set up subjects within uh, lab chart lightning. Um, and what that means is, so here you can see that I've got rat one and rat two. Uh, and I've grouped the signals that are associated to those two animals um, and some calculated signals as well. Um, that just makes the presentation of the data in your acquisition software really easy to observe um, as you're collecting the data. But what you can also do is group those subjects. So for instance, if I had more than two subjects, I could have my control group and my experimental group, and I could be aware of what those are and sort those in the, the data acquisition software. Uh, lab chart lightning works slightly different to, to those of you that have got experience with lab chart eight. In lab chart eight, uh, when you save a file, um, you create an individual file. Lab chart lightning works with projects and then individual recordings in that project. So you might have a group of eight animals that you've implanted telemeters in, um, and you'll create a single project for that group of eight animals. Um, and then you might be breaking your, your um, uh, how you collect the data into 24 hour chunks, and each of those will be saved as an individual recording um, within that project. So that keeps all of that data for that those animals grouped together in, a, in an easy to manage and easy to find place. Um, so I think that's that's kind of uh, really nice. And I'd recommend that I've in the resources, I've just uh, dropped a link to some of the support videos on Lab Chart Lightning, which will explain it in more detail uh, and what it can do. Uh, soon to be released. So this has been released internally to ADI staff at the moment, and hopefully in the next few weeks, it'll be released externally as well as the uh, scheduler function of, of Lab Chart Lightning as well, which allows you to set up to um, collect data kind of autonomously for a period of time. So here you can see that I set up uh, in this example to start on the 10th of November. Um, and it's going to end just before Christmas on the 22nd of December. Uh, so that's going to give me 43 separate recordings saved within this one project. Uh, and I've set it up to record for, uh, to start recording. So a new recording will begin at 9 a.m. every day. Uh, and it's going to have 23 hours in that uh, recording chunk. Um, before a new recording is made in Lab Chart. It's a really nice interface and really easy to use. Um, so I'd recommend that you, you look out for that when, it, when it's released. Um, so combining Kaha telemetry with data acquisition from, from AD instruments, um, you can sample up to two kilohertz, which is ideal for applications like left, left ventricular pressure and some neuroscience applications as well, or ECG recording. But you also have the option and the flexibility to sample at lower frequency if that is that's what you need. Um, and I also Lab Chart Lightning is is a really powerful data acquisition software, uh, and the development that's happening in it at the moment is going to really make that the the software to use in the uh, in the near future as well. Um, Lightning is being built with telemetry studies in mind. Um, it makes for easy management of large recording uh, with the projects and the individual recordings within them. Um, it has unlimited channels, so you can get um, analysis going in, in different channels as well uh, without worrying about uh, a maximum channel limit. Um, and also something that I haven't mentioned or have time to talk about is the cross-recording analysis, which is a nice feature. And I'd again recommend that you look at the resources uh, to the, the link for that. So I'm going to move on to talk about um, the, the final part of the webinar is, is maintaining a high level of animal welfare. But before that, I'm going to hand over to Sydney quickly. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, we are going to launch our next audience poll for you guys. Um, Phil, I'll just give you a break right now. <laughs> uh, are you currently using AD Instruments products in your research studies? So if you could just let us know yes or no to that question, um, that'll be helpful information. 
just a reminder, um, we're getting already lots of great questions in the Q&A. Um, please continue to submit those. Phil does have some more slides to present, so there is some more information coming your way. But we, we would love to see all of your questions coming in. And I'll just leave this open for another couple of seconds. Let, let everybody submit. Okay, Phil, I'm going to bring you back to join me. And I'm much. going, yeah, I'll let you continue on with your presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, so the, just the last uh, few slides, probably 10 minutes or so now, um, we, for getting really good physiological data from your telemetry studies, it's really important to, to have that high degree of animal welfare. And I think this really starts with good surgical practice. Um, and some things to consider for your surgical practice is first um, choosing the right anesthesia. Now, I'm a strong advocate for, for gaseous anesthetic. Um, I used isoflurane extensively when I was implanting telemeters and for other surgeries as well. Because what ga gaseous anesthetic does is gives you a really nice stable plane of anesthesia uh, from which animals can recover uh, relatively quickly at the end of surgery. Um, injectables certainly have their place from shorter surgeries, in my um, opinion. Um, but for telemetry uh, surgeries that can go on for a bit longer uh, in time, uh, you might need to repeat dosing, uh, which might bring in problems with, with recovery from anesthesia at the end. So I would recommend that, that using isoflurane is the best thing to do for, for telemetry recovery surgery. Um, aseptic technique is really important. Um, it's quite an invasive surgery. The risk of, of taking infection into that animal is going to uh, affect your, uh, the animal's recovery. Um, but uh, so aseptic technique is going to minimize the risk of that as much as possible. Um, we have some really nice surgery videos for telemetry on the, the AD Instruments website. So I'd encourage you to, to go and have a look there um, at those um uh those videos just to, to give you an idea of of some uh, best practice for for aseptic technique um as a surgeon when you get quite proficient at doing these surgeries it can feel quite routine but from the animal's point of view it's quite an invasive surgery uh, often we're implanting telemeters in the abdom abdominal cavity and opening the abdominal muscles um, so it's really important to think about giving some post-operative analgesia uh, and possibly some prophylactic antibiotics as well, just to minimize that risk of infection as much as possible. Um, analgesia can be something as simple as, as an anti-inflammatory, or you might want to consider something a bit more hardcore like a, an opioid, like buprenorphine. Um, when animals come round at the end of surgery, you want them to recover from that surgery as quickly as possible. Now, I would recommend to make sure in the first couple of days post-surgery that, that uh, animals are given plenty of fluid subcutaneously, have access to, to you know, wet foods to eat as well, to make sure they're well hydrated. You can follow up dosing with your analgesia or antibiotics if necessary, um, but make sure they've got some tasty food to eat as well. Uh, stuff that's calorific and that's going to encourage them to eat. I'm not suggesting that you do that throughout your study, um, by no means, but but just for a couple of days post-surgery, give them things that, that is going to encourage them to eat um, uh, and put some weight on again relatively quickly. Um, and it's really important to think about giving your animals a period of time to recover from surgery before you begin your baseline recording and your experiment. That's shown here that the impact on circadian rhythm um, uh, of, of telemetry surgery can be seen uh, carrying on for between five and six days before the circadian rhythm uh, in heart rate and blood pressure can really be seen um, coming in again. 
Um, and also there's this really nice publication from a, a group at the Danish Headache Center in Copenhagen. Um, they use uh, Kaha telemetry to measure intracranial pressure in rats. Um, and they measured their intracranial pressure um, in the days uh, preceding surgery. And they found that, that it really took uh, five or six days for, for the, their ICP measurement to stabilize post-surgery to ensure, uh, to be confident that they were getting a stable baseline. Um, so that really just emphasizes that the need to give animals that time to recover before you begin your experiment. In terms of um, a kind of example experimental timeline, you know, this is, this could be adapted to your needs, but um, I just, it's a starting point. Um, I would recommend giving between seven and 10 days uh, chance for the animals to recover post-surgery. This makes sure that any wound healing can happen. Um, uh, you gives you a chance to give continue giving prophylactic either antibiotics and analgesia as well, but it also gives time for the effect of those drugs to work off uh, before you begin your experiment. So you can be confident that they're not having an effect on the physiology of your animal during your experiment. Um, there's always uh, some weight loss associated with the telemetry surgery. So give animals time to, uh, you know, usually for a couple of like one or two days, maybe three days, animals will lose weight post-surgery um, for telemetry. So give them the chance to have that loss gain cycle and really show some consistent weight gain um, before their, their, the experiment begins. You can then at that stage take your baseline recording, which can be you know, as long as it needs to be. In this example, I've used five days um, um, before you begin your experimental phase. And now this can carry on for days, weeks, months. Uh, you can have repeated dosing of a drug if you wanted to look at disease progression, aging before the study comes to an end. Um, and what I wanted to say is because, uh, just to go back to the CAHA system, uh, without that limitation of battery life, it really gives you the flexibility um, to, to carry out your study in the way that suits you. Um, flexible and unrestricted experiments. Um, so that's kind of the surgical side of things um, and allowing your tired animals some time to recover before, before you begin your experiment. But during your study, there can be impacts on the animal's physiology as well. Um, just the first point kind of harks back to what I was saying before, but, but not all animals are going to recover from surgery at exactly the same rate. So if you are on a tight, slightly tighter time scale, you probably need to apply a little bit of flexibility still to, to your animal's recovery. Um, and say that, you know, if you've put that animal through that surgery, then, and they are showing signs of recovery, but it's a bit slower. It's not worth taking that animal take and, and culling it. You should invest a bit of time in that animal to let it get back, uh, get back up to health and, and include it in your study just at a slightly later time point. Um, there are other things that can come in that can affect your animal's behavior and physiology during your study. Uh, you're using telemetry, which is a really good gold standard for, for as uh, um, uh, conscious unrestrained recording, but animal facilities are generally quite noisy places in my experience. Um, you know, the effects of feeding times, cage changes, um, and light diets, dark cycles in, in rooms is going to really impact um, or po possibly have some impact on the physiology and behavior of your experiments. You know, every time you walk into a room where your telemetered animals are, you're potentially going to, you know, that's going to pique the animal's attention. Uh, so you might see some impact of that. Now, what I would recommend is accepting that, that all of that needs to happen. You know, feeding needs to happen, cage changes need to happen, um, and you're going to have to compromise a little bit. You might want 24 hours of data, but you might say you have to say, okay, I'll have 23 hours of data and I'll give the animal care staff uh, in the animal facility an hour to do the, the things that they need to do with the animals. Um, and I won't collect data for that hour because I think that that, that is going to have an impact on physiology and an impact on behavior. 
Um, something to consider is reversing the light dark cycle of your studies, particularly if you are doing any behavioral experiments as well, um, because that means that the animals are going to be more active during the daytime uh, if it's dark where they're housed um, because they're nocturnal animals. Um, and the last thing is to just make sure you keep good notes. So like I would write lots and lots and lots of notes in a lab book um, uh, in a sort of more analog fashion. But you can also put drop comments into lab chart uh, or annotations into lab chart lightning um, to mark in your data or specifically in your data anything that's happened that may have impacted uh, that you think might need to be taken into consideration when you're analyzing that data. Um, in animal research, um, we should be thinking about applying uh, reduction and refinement to our studies. Uh, there's well, the three R's of, of, of animal research, but with telemetry, I think there are two aspects of the three R's that we can really introduce, and that's reduction and refinement. Um, with the wireless power uh, and continuous recording that you can get with, with car sciences particularly, means that you're collecting more data from each animal. Um, the increased degree of accuracy that you get with Miller microtip pressure sensors and the two kilohertz sampling rate gives you more confidence in the, the data that you're recording from each animal and might mean that you need a smaller sample size as well. Um, but we also offer something called co-housing mode, which allows you to house two implanted animals and record for them both simultaneously in the same cage. Um, so that's going to improve animal welfare. Um, the rats are social species, so they, they interact with each other um, and that, that improves animal welfare. Um, with the co-housing mode, though, you can, um, from a refinement point of view, you can um, actually implant two telemeters in a large rat using the same um, part of the technology. Um, over 350 gram rat that would need to be, but that gives you the possibility of recording up to four physiological parameters from, from a rat, um, which builds in a really, really um, uh, quite powerful chronic experiments that, that's not possible with other systems. So just in summary, um, what telemetry-based uh, research allows you to do is show, um, get higher data quality, um, give you advanced study options, and potentially uh, reduce some cost as well. And building in some of the considerations that I've talked about today is going to make your, your lives um, hopefully a little bit easier uh, when you're thinking about designing your experiments as well. Um, I will say that, that the importance of the animal welfare, you know, the good surgical practice and the surgical recovery, I think is really important for just reducing the impact of that surgery uh, on the physiology of the animals and the data that you collect post-surgery as well. So thank you very much for um, listening to me. All right. Um, the first question that I'd like to ask, um, you may have mentioned this in the talk, but this was submitted a little early on. Um, Douglas is curious um, about the size of the catheter. So um, a two French catheter is suitable for a rat, but it's likely quite large for a mouse. Is there another option for mouse studies? Um, so for the car sciences system at the moment doesn't support mouse pressure. So yeah, the, the two French catheter is too large uh, for implantation uh, in a mouse. Um, it's something that we're actively looking at at the moment, um, uh, mouse pressure telemetry system uh, with the um, Miller uh, technology incorporated, but um, it's quite the early stages at the moment. So. Um, for other studies, though, like um, ECG and things like that, what what would be the size of the catheter for a mouse? All oh, right, exactly. So for ECG studies, the biopotential leads for the mouse are, I forget what they are off the top of my head, but they're certainly mouse appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, and uh, you're reachable, your information um, 
can be found yeah. on the page. So if anyone wants to reach out to you uh, with more questions, they can do so there. Um, okay, next question from Irving. Is there real-time viewing of data or do you have to download after acquiring the data? I think that's a good question. Yeah, really good question. Um, so everything is um, collected in real time. So you can see it using the lab chart eight or the lab chart lightning software, um, and it's collected in real time. You can perform analysis on it in real time with some considerations for the, the performance of your computer, but it is possible to do that as well. Um, yeah, so you can watch the, the blood pressure waveform come in uh, as you're collecting it, for instance. That's, that's great. Um, okay, John has a question about data storage. Um, they are curious about why you would break up the, um, the data into chunks rather than just record continuously. Um, and then, you know, rather recording 24 hours and then determine the data, which to keep in or analyze, like why you would have to break it up into um, chunks with, you know, storage nowadays being quite large. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. I mean, storage, data storage, hard drive space, cloud space is not so much an issue anymore. Um, but as somebody who has looked through hours and hours of um, telemetry data, I can say from my experience that I like to be able to close one file and open another one. That's just personal preference. It, it breaks up in my mind that that's... Um, how to look at the data. Having said that, um, as analysis platforms become a bit more, um, become more powerful and can cope with that really long-term recording, um, you might not, you might be able to analyze that data more easily, but at some degree, you know, you can't guarantee that there's not gonna be an artifact somewhere. Um, somebody is going to have to eyeball that data. Scrolling through an infinite file, I think, is not something that I would want to do. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our next question from Lee, they say, great talk. Um, can telemetry signals be correctly recorded while animals are, for example, running on a treadmill? Are there any interference from the treadmill motor? So, um, yeah, so I didn't get into it in the talk, but the, the rat telemetry system, um, the rat telemeters themselves have a battery built in, um, which is for exactly using the, the telemeters or implanted animals uh, in behavioral studies. Um, the battery gives you about four hours, depending on the telemeter model, but about four hours uh, recording away from the wireless power field. Um, at which point after that four hours, you would need to put the, uh, the rat back into the wireless power field and the battery will charge up again. Um, so yeah, running on um, treadmills, uh, you can do that up to five meters away from the data receiver um, is perfectly possible. Um, the motor of the um, treadmill, I don't think should impact the um, signal. It's it's wireless transmission, so it's in the sort of gigahertz range. Uh, so I don't think that that would impact the, the transmission from the telemeter to the pad. That's excellent. Okay. Um, all right, we have another question from Ned. This is quite an interesting one. Um, for those short-term short experiments, such as days, um, how do people proceed with um, insertion of the catheter? Um, he suggests, you know, would you glue the transducer on the back to minimize surgery? Um, how would you go about um, implanting for short-term experiments? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, it's not something that I know that people do with the Kaha system, but um, with other telemetry systems, I'm aware that you can buy effectively jackets that you can slot the telemeter body into. Um, so the animal wears this kind of jacket thing and the, the catheter then goes inside the animal. 
um, but the body is, is outside. The consideration with Kaha and why that might not work is that the wireless power field uh, and the position of the telemeter within the animal needs to be within the wireless power field. The back of the large rat might be a little bit too far away from that wireless power field uh, for powering. Right, okay. Um, there is another question. Uh, can your lab chart software capture video snapshots or is it continuous? Um, you can record um, video with the video capture module, which comes as part of LabChart 8 Pro. Um, it becomes quite challenging with large installations of telemetry animals uh, or telemetered animals because uh, you can basically put in one camera or you can you can multiplex a camera like with a sort of small CCTV system. But then the resolution of the image that you get from each cage is quite small and not necessarily great. So it is certainly possible, um, but it, it's a bit challenging to um, to get that. But with the video capture module, you can time sync that video to the to the waveform data. So if you're only looking at one animal, then it's, it's a great thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Great response. Thanks. Um, I am going to make that the last question. We have reached the top of the hour. Um, Phil, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing your experience and your knowledge. It was such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> in closing, we hope you enjoyed this Inside Scientific webinar sponsored by AD Instruments and produced in partnership with the American Physiological Society and the European Council for Cardiovascular Research, and we hope you'll join us again soon.